So the second part of this video, and reminding you you're doing one chapter in one day from this point out in the course, um, I'm going to go through each of the four macromolecules um, and give them all just a little bit more of an explanation. So hopefully we can build on some of what we've gone through in a general sense in the first half of this lesson and, and build on it in our understanding of these four macromolecules. So the first one would be carbohydrates. And carbohydrates are quite common in biological life. And, and some of them are really, really small single sugar molecules. And so just the monomers, glucose is a monomer. And so it's a really common molecule and illustrates the idea that sometimes sugars are very small. Sometimes we can have really, really large molecules that are carbohydrates. So polysaccharides are polymers. One thing that I would just draw your attention to is the last slide of this PowerPoint. And so the last slide of the PowerPoint, I've tried to summarize what is the name of the monomer, what is the name of the polymer, and, you know, like I had said, only three of these macromolecules are technically polymers, and that is represented in that last slide as well. So you might want to refer to that as we go through, just for reference and, and kind of um, context of, of what we're doing here. So sugar monomers, the monomers are called monosaccharides, and the polymers are called polysaccharides. And so we're going to talk about both of these, monosaccharides and polysaccharides, throughout this course. If we were to talk about monosaccharides, we could have different length of carbon chains making up the monosaccharides. And so glucose and fructose, which are really common monosaccharides, have six carbons in them. Other monosaccharides that exist have a variation. So sometimes three, sometimes seven, but these ones that are six are really, really common. So mon monosaccharides as an example of their use is really what we use on a cellular level to generate energy. The basic chemical formula is two parts hydrogen to one part carbon and one part oxygen. So it fits this general fixed ratio idea. That's why it's classified as a carbohydrate. But as an example, glucose actually, like it says above, has six carbons in it, um, six oxygens, and 12 hydrogens. So I knew you would want to see what this actually looks like in a picture. So these would be pictures of glucose and fructose in either of the two forms. So we could have these six um, carbons in glucose um, in a straight chain, or we could have a ring structure. And so glucose in a ring is, is sometimes more common. And just keeping tabs on the um, images in your textbook, glucose is always illustrated as this sort of purpley blue um, shape that, that has the six carbons at each of those corners. Um, and it has an oxygen sticking out of it. So it does have six carbons and that oxygen there. So that's what glucose looks like. Those would be monomers or monosaccharides. Um, and we are going to talk about them more. We could link two monomers together, two monosaccharides, um, to make a disaccharide. So this would be two glucose stuck together as I draw a simplified structure, and I should have changed to that kind of purple color because that's more in line with your textbook, right? That kind of purpley blue shape. So I just drew a diagram of a disaccharide. Now, if we link them, it's in a dehydration reaction. And if you remember that, the reason we called it a dehydration reaction is that the water had to get out of the way. So the monomers would have a hydro hydroxide and a hydrogen attached to them. And those two have to get out of the way for the two monomers to come together, right? Water would come out, which is what dehydrating things does. And so it's a dehydration reaction to make to go from monosaccharides to a disaccharide. So as an example here, table sugar is a disaccharide. Um, it has a fructose um, and, uh, and a glucose, to, and, and the name of table sugar technically is sucrose. So that idea, table sugar is a disaccharide. If we were to take this up more and more and make a longer chain, 
we would call it then a polysaccharide. So many monomer monomers in a row. So polymers of monosaccharides are called polysaccharides. There are a lot of different functions of polysaccharides, and you actually did a pre-reading question on polysaccharides and how they are the same and how they are different in the cells. So they're the same because they are all polymers of glucose, right? So that same glucose image linked over and over and over again. So polymers of glucose, that's how they're all the same. But they do have very different structural and functional considerations. So that's illustrating that dehydration, just in case my diagrams weren't neat enough for you, of the two monosaccharides becoming a disaccharide. And this one's a little different. It's not the sucrose. It's another disaccharide. It's maltose. So a different uh, disaccharide illustrated there. So the major kinds of polysaccharides, this would be like the four star answer in your pre-reading if you got there. And if not, then the, the pre-reading is an introduction and a place that you can build upon. So there are three different kinds. We have starch, glycogen, and cellulose. The similarity, like I had just said, is that all these molecules are polysaccharides and they're all made up of that individual repeating bead of glucose, so the monomer of glucose. So the functional difference, if you were to take a look at that first, after you looked at how they are the same, um, would be that starch is found in plants. Um, and so the function of starch in plants would be to store energy. Now, we eat starch, starchy plants like potatoes, for energy, but if we think about the purpose in the plants, um, the plant actually put that energy there for itself, not for us to eat. <laughs> and so in terms of the function in, in plant cells, the starch is there as an, a source of energy or st energy storage. The parallel to that, and so these two are linked, in your liver right now, hopefully, is a polymer, and it's the repeating glucose, and it's called glycogen. And so why you have glycogen in your body is to store energy. And so you, you put that glycogen in your liver to, to store energy for later. And so we have plants up at the top here in starch, and then we have animals, but they do share that idea of energy storage. Now, the other parts or the other macromolecule, or sorry, the other polysaccharide that you would have read about would be cellulose. So cellulose, we also think of as fiber in plants, and it's a polymer of glucose, same before, as we'd said before, but in plant cells, it's for structure. And again, we do eat plants, so in, in terms of our use of it, it is for fiber in our diets, but for that poor little plant cell, it was so that it held up the apple tree or whatever it was, right? Um, or the beanstalk. Now, these two had sort of a comparison between, so they, they were two uh, molecules that were both energy storage, one in plants and one in animals. And I did put a secondary little note in here, just so you can see again, this um, sort of parallelism. And so there is um, a structural polysaccharide in animals, but just not in humans. And so the exoskeleton, like so like the, um, the shell of a beetle is made up of a polysaccharide and it's called chitin. And so chitin is, is really this uh, parallel, so it's a structural molecule in animals. But like I said, not in humans, and so I kind of left it down below, and you probably wouldn't have included that in your answer of your pre-reading. So we've said how these polysaccharides are the same and how they are different as far as function goes, but we haven't talked about their structure, and structure and function are always worth um, noting in biology. And so if we take a look at their structural differences here, um, and, and before I get there, you can see that they're all these repeating um, I haven't changed my color because it matched so nicely. All these repeating little beads, they all have exactly the same bead in them. And that bead, that monomer, is the monosaccharide of glucose. And so starch, if we were to take a look at that, is this coiled polymer. So it kind of comes out in a coil shape. 
So that was for energy storage in plants as its functional reason. Glycogen was for energy storage in animals. It's similar in that it's coiled, but it's also branched. And so we can see these branched, branching coils coming off. And so to draw, it looked more like my hair. <laughs> Um, branching coils, so coiled and highly branched. Those two were kind of like the, the partners there. Cellulose was a little different, so that was in function for structure in, in plant cells. And if we take a look at these, they're straight chained. We can't digest cellulose because it's sort of fortified with, take a look at this, good old hydrogen bonds, these secondary bonds between these polar molecules that fortify and make these cellulose molecules harder to break down. So I've gone through um, how things are the same, so I compared them, and I also said how they were different, and I talked about how they are different in function and structure. All right, so moving on to the next. I've alluded to this before. Again, if you're not sure, go with proteins as your answer. So there's always like a default um, answer in, in physics. If you've ever taken physics, your default answer is gravity. Um, <laughs> um, most courses kind of have this like go-to. And, and in biology, your go-to is proteins because proteins are so numerous in our bodies and they have so many different um, jobs that they really are maybe, maybe, I dare say, the most important macromolecule. So a protein is a polymer, and it's a built from 20 different amino acids. So amino acids are the monomers. You can have amino acid chains that are thousands of amino acids long. So proteins that are made up of thousands of amino acids. There's a lot of different functions of these. And like I said, you have listed those. I should change my color here. Uh, to, to protein color. I'll go dark purple for protein. Um, <laughs> and they really are very diverse. And each specific structure has a very different function in the body. And so the shape of these proteins is absolutely critical for the job that they do or the function that they do. So we have this idea of structure being shape and their function being their job or their role. So the functions of proteins, and I'm going to try and come up with some things that you might know already to kind of to base this on. So structural proteins, um, you have things that, that connect the different, your different body parts. So that's good to hold you all together. Contractile proteins are in your muscles. And so that's how you contract your muscles and move things around. Defes defensive proteins um, include antibodies of your immune system. So they're tiny little proteins, actually little Y-shaped proteins, much smaller than some of the other proteins that we'll talk about. Some hormones are proteins and not all of them as we're gonna see some lipids or some hormones are actually lipids, but some hormones are proteins. We could have proteins as little receptor proteins. And so on um, the surface of a cell, you can have little extensions that are protein in their structure or in, in their, uh, their makeup. And so they, they kind of identify or, or send signals outside of a cell. We could have transport proteins that help move things in and out of a cell. And we'll talk more about those in uh, the coming chapters. We could have storage proteins. And so sometimes you meet, might need more amino acids on a cellular level and so you can store them up and then also a big one here are all enzymes enzymes in your digestive system but also on a cellular level enzymes are required for chemical reactions to happen you have so many different kinds of specific enzymes um, and they are all proteins and so you could think of them as dietary enzymes but also there are way more on a cellular level that, that regulate all the chemical reactions that keep you alive. So the big thing with amino acids is the protein, it, it is the protein monomer. So I talked about amino acids uh, before, having an amino group 
and a carboxyl group. And carboxyl groups are sometimes called carboxylic acid. So that's how we got the name amino acid. Amino acids are the monomers and they are linked together to form the polymers called proteins. There is another name for proteins, a fancier name, uh, which are poly peptides. And I know this is coming up, but I like putting it in here. Um, and so if you're using that final chart, that last page of the PowerPoint, um, you'll, you'll see the word polypeptide there. So the way that we link amino acids is a dehydration reaction. So same as we had before, the hydroxide and the hydrogen have to get out of the way for the two things to join right and so that removal of water is dehydration and check this out do you remember what i said enzymes were so we make proteins with the use of proteins holy chicken in the egg right that idea that proteins are everywhere and they're absolutely essential for life and have so many different jobs so this dehydration reaction what it does is it links a carboxyl group from one amino acid to the amino group of the next amino acid. And that bond, that bond is called a peptide bond. And so that's how we get the polymer name, let me switch colors again, a polypeptide. That is the polymer of a protein because it's made up of many peptide bonds. So this is that illustrated. And so these would be two amino acids. So this would be amino acid one and amino acid two. Remember I said there's 20 different amino acids and they are different by this R group. So this R group might be a square and this R group might be a triangle. These would be two different kinds of amino acids. And the, the fact that it's just represented with an R here is a bit of a misnomer because there's a lot of um, atoms that, that make up those differences. And so what we're focusing on are these two ends. So this would be the amino end and the carboxyl group, right? Those are the two ends of every amino acid. And so what happens is that a carboxyl group and an amino acid group come together and there's the hydroxyl and there's the hydrogen that get out of the way so that these two can come together. The water gets out of the way, so that's dehydration reaction. And that bond is called a peptide bond. All right, so this idea that our polypeptide is our polymer of a protein. So the amino acid sequence causes the polypeptide to make a particular shape. So the amino acids, remember, there's 20 different, and they're different by that R group that was uh, illustrated there. And back to when we were building the molecules or looking at the shapes. Remember when I drew the little uh, protein poodle or we built it? That idea that there is a very specific molecular geometry to these things. So it really matters the bonding angles and the different elements that are, are part of these molecules. You do have a very specific shape and it's the shape of the protein that determines its function. And so it's form and function. It's shape and it's job, if you remember I used those words. If for some reason a protein shape is altered, it will no longer work the way that it was meant to. And so this is really important. It's also really tasty. Um, and denat, de how we say this funny, denaturation or denaturation, however you want to say it, tomato, tomato, is what that's called. So if you change the shape of a protein because you expose it to an excess of heat, or a rapid change in acidity or pH, or by the introduction of a lot of salt or other substances, if it changes shape, it's no longer going to be able to do its job. And so you denature a protein by changes like these. So in the chat, you can tell me your favorite um, protein to denature. My favorite denature to pro, or protein to denature might be cooking of eggs. Maybe yours is the barbecuing of a hamburger. Remember I said that it's delicious. Oftentimes cooking or even marinating 
or preserving, all of those acts, what we're doing is denaturing a protein. Okay, so there's a little bit more in proteins. And proteins, like I said, shape is everything. When you categorize the shape of a protein and the structure of a protein, you could actually look at different levels. And so you could talk about the first or primary level, the second, the third. If you don't like the word tertiary, you don't have to use it. Go with third or the fourth. And, and usually by this point, people are like, I don't like the word quaternary. So um, go with fourth. And so we're going to talk quickly um, using the next slide because there's pictures and I like that about these different levels. So again, it's a bit of a hierarchy, zooming in and working our way out. And so when we talk about structure of a protein, the first level is really talking about the sequence of those amino acids. So these are all the different amino acids, or some of them. Remember that there's 20 different amino acids, and the order of them really matters. So this is the order of amino acids. So amino acid order. The second level is the amount of um, hydrogen bonding. Because we have this specific molecular geometry, there's also the, the possibility of sort of interplay between the charged regions or the poles of these organic compounds. And so because of these hydrogen bonds, good old hydrogen bonds, you could have a coil, a helix, or you could have folds or pleated, right? Coils or folds. And that's what we're talking about at the secondary level of structure. The third level of structure is a little bit awkward. So the third level of structure is how all of these things get kind of balled up on themselves. And the balling up on themselves, I know not very technical language, results in a subunit. And so this is a glob, again, not a technical term, a glob of polypeptide that sort of is all stuck together because oftentimes, proteins or polypeptides are so big, we can actually look at the fourth level of structure and how these subunits come together. So this would be one subunit, but you might have multiple subunits coming together. So that would be how we work from the bottom up in proteins, because if any of this stuff is wrong, that's going to cause the, the, the protein not to work. That's how specific structure is to the function of these macromolecules. Okay, so one more here, nucleic acids. And nucleic acids are really interesting. We're still in the world of polymers. So protein, or sorry, um, carbohydrates are polymers, proteins are polymers, and nucleic acids are all polymers. Um, and, and nucleic acids, what we're talking about are your genes or your DNA. And oftentimes that's something of particular interest to us. Um, I know that it's one of my favorite topics um, in this course is genetics and how that all comes together. But on a molecular level, because that's still where we are, um, we're talking about the polymers of nucleic acid. And so the building block of nucleic acids are called nucleotides. Nucleotides get built into polymers that are called polynucleotides. Okay, so polynucleotides would be DNA, and DNA contains genes. You inherit your DNA from your parents, right? And really, the cool thing about DNA, or all nucleic acids for that matter, is that they replicate. So you can make copies um, to grow, to reproduce, for all those reasons. What DNA do does is it's like the blueprint or the recipe. It programs the cell's activity. It directs, it organizes the making of protein. So as you've noticed, we're back to proteins again. So DNA in your cells uses RNA, both of these are examples of nucleic acids, that's what the NA stands for, and RNA makes proteins. And so that's what we're talking. 
DNA works through an intermediary, RNA, to make proteins. We're going to talk about in a later chapter that process of transcription and translation. Really just an intro to it now. So DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. So they are nucleic acids. And what the deoxyribo is talking about is one of the components of a nucleotide. So nucleotide is the monomer, right? And nucleotides have three parts. They have a sugar, which I said was deoxyribose in DNA. And it's just plain old ribose, so it has an extra oxygen in RNA. And it also has, you remember how I said, a phosphate group. Oh, I should have changed color to the yellow. And it also has, the second time that nitrogen is showing up, a nitrogenous base. And there are four different nitrogenous bases. That is it. So if we were to talk about monomers of nucleotides, they have the same phosphate, they have the same sugar, and there's four versions of nitrogenous bases. There's a little bit of a difference between DNA and RNA, so I'm going to base my conversation on DNA and then make a few exceptions to explain the RNA. So remember, DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid because of the sugar that is in the nucleotide, whereas RNA is ribonucleic acid um, for the ribose, that is the sugar, as part of the nucleotide. So the four nitrogenous bases, remember I said this is how things are different. They are adenine, thiamine, cytosine, and guanine. They get shortened to A, T, C, and G. So really, if we were to take a look at this, this is a nucleotide. It has, uh, I'm going to change color. Whoops, that's highlighter. Oh, come on. Um, so there's my phosphate group. Here is, I'll go back to that color that was a sugar, my deoxyribose, and then it has this nu nucleotide sticking out here. So that nucleotide happens to be adenine. So this as a nucleotide is repeated. There is another nucleotide down here with its phosphate, its sugar, and its nitrogenous base. And this nitrogenous base is thiamine. Um, so in these ones, we've got this idea of a repeating pattern. These nucleotides are all linked together, right, being the monomer of our polymer, and they're linked sugar to phosphate base. And so what we call that is the sugar phosphate backbone, and then we have these nitrogenous bases sticking out. And so we've got this repeating pattern, which is really what a polymer is. So in DNA, we actually have two polynucleotides, and these two polynucleotides wrap around each other and make a double helix. So this double helix, this is probably the most iconic um, structure or image in, in biology, maybe in science, even in the background of like cheesy uh, TV shows or whatever. If they want to make something look scientific or smart, they'll have a model of DNA in the background somewhere. Um, and so this idea that they wrap around each other and bond together. So and there's a very specific base pairing. So where they're linked are those hydro are those nitrogenous bases. And the two strands associate, and we've got always our nitrogenous bases pairing up in a very specific way. So we've got A's joining with T's and C's joining with G's. So adenine, thymine, thymine cytosine and guanine and check it out one more time that three little dot thing there that is another hydrogen bond remember how that was important okay so that idea that this is really the structure of the dna or the double helix we've got that repeating sugar phosphate backbone the protruding nitrogenous bases, we have very specific or particular base pairings here, and they coil around each other in this really long molecule called DNA, which is a, poly, a double polynucleotide. So 
if you understand that, the small um, extension of that is RNA. That was the go-between the, the, your genes and making proteins. So RNA is actually a single-stranded polynucleotide, and it has everything the same except for it doesn't have thymine. It has uracil instead of thymine. Okay. Most people are interested in DNA because, like I said, it's, it's about genetics. And so a particular sequence of nucleotides actually inform or are the recipe for making a polypeptide or as you can remember oh my cursor's gone away uh, a protein so it says here polypeptide but you could read that as a protein so the very like snippet of your dna is a gene most DNA in the molecules um, consist of millions of base pairs and then consequently have many genes programmed into them. Um, but it really is absolutely amazing that those are the instructions that actually code or are coded with all of the information for making all of the rest of life's structures and functions, which is probably why I think genetics is super cool. Um, and uh, yeah, just that diversity. So the last of the four macromolecules almost there would be lipids and lipids are insoluble in water. So this is the first one. They're different in a couple ways. So they're not a uh, polymer and they are also not soluble in water. So your body has different ways of dealing with them even though they are water hating or hydrophobic or water fearing, I should I said hating. Um, but that idea that lipids are insoluble in water is a bit different than the other macromolecules. And we'll, we'll talk about how they get used because of this characteristic. If we were to take a look at what lipids are made up of, they mainly consist of carbon and hydrogen atoms that are linked by non-polar covalent bonds. So we're back to that world of hydrocarbons. And if you remember when I was talking about the hydrocarbons, they didn't become soluble in water until we had those functional groups. So the types of lipids of notes would be fats, and we can think about diet, uh, your diet when we talk about that. Phospholipids, which are really important as we talk about um, the cell in the next chapter. So all the cell membranes are made up of phospholipids, so really important, and then steroids. And so the steroids are hormones um, and other things. Okay, so lipids are the only macromolecule that is not a polymer. So let's talk a little bit about what they actually are. Um, you know what's not on there is waxes, but that's okay, not so much in humans. Okay, so fats again is a macromolecule because it's a large uh, molecule often and it's made up of two kinds of smaller molecules we have glycerol linked to a fatty acid and so if you have a triglyceride that would be a glycerol with three fatty acids attached to it now paralleling what we've talked about before the linking of the fatty acid to the glycerol is through another dehydration reaction. And so we've talked about this pretty much in every macromolecule. That's how, even though they're not mo uh, mon or polymers, that's how the two components come together. The key thing about fats is that they actually contain twice as much energy per gram than um, proteins or polysaccharides. And so the main role for fats would be energy storage in humans. We actually have two different kinds of fats because we have two different kinds of fatty acids. And so when we think back to the um, single and double bonds between carbons, it really changes the uh, molecular shape. It changes the geometry. So if we were to have a double bond between two carbons, we would call that an unsaturated fatty acid. They have a double bond there and it changes the shape. We talk about them as being um, unsaturated because they're not fully taken up with hydrogen, right? 
And so they're, they're not fully full of hydrogen. Now it does actually add to a little bit of a kink. So unsaturated um, fatty acids don't like to pack really close together. They don't like to pack into a solid. And so we often think of oils as unsaturated fatty acids. In contrast to that, sat saturated fatty acids would have no double bonds. So in a sense, they're fully filled up with hydrogens. They're saturated with hydrogens. That's what we're talking about with the unsaturated and saturated. So no double bonds in a saturated um, fatty acid. And so because there's no double bonds, they actually are able to pack tighter together. So we often think of solids. So butter um, or lard or, um, yeah, maybe maybe think uh, coconut um, oil. It does tend to pack closer together. So as a bit of a side note, hydrogenated vegetable oils create trans fats. And you really shouldn't be eating trans fats. I think they're now outlawed in Canada. Um, and they're really unnatural. So what they do is they... Um, they chemically alter the molecular structure so that an oil becomes a solid. And, and, and really what they're doing is monkeying with it. And your body doesn't know how to react to that. It, it, it reacts strangely because it's not a natural substance. substance. So I just threw that in there a little bit, um, but I think we're getting past the point of uh, really eating trans fats in most things. So the second example of a lipid would be a phospholipid. And I said phospholipid was really important in all of the cell membranes. All cell membranes are made up of a phospholipid bilayer. So talking about a phospholipid, they're similar to fats because they have, like the glycerol head, this would have a functional group that makes it um, polar in nature. And so we've got um, a, a water loving head. And then it has these hydrocarbon tails. And so those would be water I know it's water fearing, I always put water hating. And so that would be a, a really quick diagram of an individual phospholipid. But phospholipids have this cool way because of their two different sides of auto organizing into a bilayer. So down here we have an illustration of a bilayer. Bi because there are two layers of phospholipids and they're arranged so that the hydrophobic tails, the water fearing tails are protected inside that bilayer and the hydrophilic heads or the water loving heads are exposed to the inside and whoops inside and the outside of a cell because we are water based right so that aids in its solubility it's partially soluble in water and allows for um, these membranes to, to to bind the different components of our cells all right I think I got everything there okay the last one here as an example of another kind of lipid would be steroids. And steroids we could talk about as hormones, but they're also important in that um, cholesterol is an example of a steroid. It's not a hormone specifically. Um, it still classifies as a steroid. And cholesterol is also important in the, the plasma membrane. So the outside of a cell, as we do our cell next um, chapter, has the phospholipid, bilayer and it also has cholesterol in amongst those phospholipids and so we're going to talk more about cholesterol and the phospholipids as being really important lipids when we talk about the cell next class Cool. So here is our um, chart that I was alluding to before. All of the words. So there are multiple words. So the four macromolecules being carbohydrates, proteins, nucleic acids, and lipids, and the name of the monomer. So we have monosaccharides and polysaccharides. You could talk about disaccharides in there. You have amino acids, and remember they linked with peptide bonds. So a polymer of amino acids is a polypeptide.
because that was the name of that bond. And then nucleic acids having nucleotides with their three components and then becoming a polynucleotide. So DNA, RNA were examples of polynucleotides. And then our last discussion, which were on lipids, because they are a little bit of an oddball. But all of these are large molecules. They are all organic molecules, and they're really key components in talking about human biology.